than the platelet activation. But we have to remember that this inferior ST elevation can be associated with, for example, ascending aortic dissection into the right coronary artery. In that case, the physical exam will be important. You know, the aortic regurgitation murmur, patient may be in shock, in tamponade. So we need to be keeping our mind open that recognizing something, going for the obvious, but think about the differential and don't do a mistake. So this is another patient with chest pain and anterior ST elevation in mind. And see that the rhythm is still in sinus and there is massive ST elevation in the precordial list. When we take these patients, I ask two questions to the fellows. I don't need to know the details. Is it real? That means, is it STEMI or is it STEMI mimic? We'll talk about that in a minute. STEMI mimic means that it looks like a STEMI, but it's not STEMI. And then the other question I have is, is if it is real, is it stable or unstable? Stable rhythm wise, stable hemodynamic wise. We need to figure that out. And then the third question is, is it good to go? That means, you know, the STEMI in a 99 year old dementia coming from nursing home, and then patient is DNR, DNI, that is one type of problem compared to 58 year old with anterior ST elevation MI and good to go. In those patients, it is important to figure out. And now at the request of Rafik Bhai, I'm going to bring some other compounding issues, such as post cardiac arrest, such as post cardiac arrest and shock, how we can, what I call smell the bigger trouble by the EKG and then clinical presentation and what we do. So this is simple, right? Anyone can jump in that while we are taking this patient to the cat lab, we give this patient the anti-platelets, anti-coagulation. And after the first injection in the cat lab, we see some T3 flow with high grade stenosis with the injection, the artery opened up and this happened. What to do? If anyone raises hand, please give that individual a floor. If not, then I would request any faculty to jump in or I will proceed. <laughs> the thing is, that he has given you the basic clue, post reperfusion. The title is post reperfusion. That means whatever we see, we are seeing is likely to be related to that. And what do we expect after reperfusion? Reperfusion. Well, thank you because I'm not dual H, but when I show this thing in our fellows, a resident, almost 50% will not see this post reperfusion length title. They will also only focus on the EKG. So in the board, it is important and the exam purposes and in practice uh, that, you know, you pay attention that what is written in the, in the test. Can, so you, bring, can you, can you yeah. bring one of the participants, please? Yeah. Okay, okay. now let him, let him speak. Um, yeah. Please, Rafik, please. Will I, will I bring him to the Hello. panelist? Yes, uh, sir. Yeah, but, okay. Uh, okay, okay, sir. One minute. Je, je, um, uh, e answer question je post, uh, post Okay, 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 so Jini Bolse Viti Take Boli, it's a heart rate. Tachycardia by definition is more than 100. And bradycardia is less than 60 in cardiology board is less than 50. So, so this is not tachycardia, it's a heart rate is 100, sorry, 96, 97, if you calculate. So this is not tachycardia. So think about that, Rovik Bhai. Yeah, so did you bring him? Yes, uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. 80, 84, 80, 84. 80, 84. Someone said accelerated junctional rhythm. Three answer. 
idioventricular rhythm, accelerated yes, but, but let's have the a person who is, is he on the panel list panel now? Uh, yes, sir, he is in the panelist list. Uh, Dr. This? Muhammad Zavid Mehdi Hussein. Uh, Dr. Zavid, Zavid Mehdi, can you hear us? Yes, sir. Dr. Javed Mehdi, thank you for coming forward. Javed Mehdi. Yes, sir. Well, you you, you yeah. said ventricular, ventricular tachycardia, right? Yes, sir. And why did you say ventricular? I mean, your answer is correct, actually. Uh, with a little bit modification, it is correct answer. Why did you say ventricular tachycardia? Mm -hmm. So because there is uh, no POF and uh, there is concordance in the chest lead. Okay. So I, I think your answer is partially correct. Uh, you said concordance. You cannot say concordance from this ECG because if you look at chest lead, because this ECG is a mixture of uh, uh, white QRS and narrow QRS. So if you look uh, in the bottom strip, you will see that the initial complexes are wide QRS. So clearly those are ventricular beat. The rate is less than 100. So it does not fall into the classification of ventricular tachycardia. It doesn't fall into the classification of tachycardia. So it's a ventricular rhythm uh, in the setting of what Hafiz mentioned, um, uh, an intervention done on this patient. And then I'll let Hafiz take over from here. Sir, uh, so, sir, people that, so, sir, sir, people that yeah. have a question, sir. sir. When, uh, from our participant said, sir, the nodes that is a lead to the nodes are the beginning of the AST. Are these ready to get P, sir? Does it? Oh, yes. So yeah. this is a slow ventricular rhythm, and you can see there is a notch immediately after the QRS complex. That's a retrograde yes. P wave, which can happen at this slow rate. Hafiz, please. Yeah. So uh, the perfusion arrhythmias we don't treat, and then we we watch, but Rarely you need some hemodynamic support if the blood pressure drops. So we, we proceeded with the uh, uh, PCI stent and then patient did okay. So when you are dealing with the STEMI, it is important, critical that we recognize the clinical presentation, EKG, and importantly, we cannot wait for biomarkers to define the ST elevation of mine. And you all know this Peter Levis famous cartoon that atherosclerotic plaque, then study classification of atherosclerosis, then the uh, progression of the atherosclerotic into the plaque rupture, plaque erosion, plaque growth, and then, and then further luminal narrowing or acute coronary syndrome. Luminal narrowing progressively will give you angina, and then, then the uh, patient goes into uh, stable angina and then unstable angina. In the meantime, if the plaque ruptures and the plaque erosion, there is uh, acute coronary syndrome, vast majority will be coming to our emergency room uh, in, as the, in the shape of unstable angina, non ST elevation MI, and ST elevation MI. It is actually a myth that the STEMI has higher uh, mortality. Non STEMI is no less, it, it's, the, it's the question of time. If you look at the left hand okay. side, non STEMI and STEMI overall over time they are almost same if you leave them untreated. And STEMI world, the earlier, the balloon perfusion earlier is going to make a big difference in terms of prognosis. As you can see, the, earth, the lowest mortality is on those group where the reperfusion is done early. So it is very important. It is very important therefore that we recognize this by the clinical presentation and the EKGs and then make a strategy how we are going to deliver the care. I so you. I'm going to now show you a series of EKGs to Can familiarize it? ourselves with the clinical presentation. That Let's say, right. yeah. Can I, uh, is right? Yeah. Uh, the ECG that has been shown that actually reperfusion arrhythmia, that's actually re reassuring. That means the flow has been established. And as Hafiz Bhai was saying, this was actually idioventricular rhythm. Ventricular rhythm. And this, that has not reached the level of tachycardia. So it's not VT, though it's ventricular rhythm. And we have to just watch because most of these are self-limiting. And 
sometimes we just need a little bit of one of support if the patient is hypotensive. And intervention or revascularization in either way, either by thrombolysis or preferably by PCI, will actually produce good results. That's what he has been showing. Thank you, Abhijay. Um, so, I, I have a question. Yeah. So the, the ECG that you showed, the rate was less than 100. So let's make an assumption that there was a five second of ventricular tachycardia after intervention with a rate of 130. Yeah. Will you do anything else or just follow the patient? So um, the non-sustained VT, that's what you are referring to, uh, we just sit tight um, because some will check that basic thing that potassium, magnesium level, and then you are in the cath lab, then make sure that the deep perfusion is good and there is no issues with the um, angiographic picture and, and you just sit tight. The question becomes much more complicated if it is sustained VT after. And, and it becomes even more complicated if it is pulseless VT or VF. So the rule of thumb that after pre perfusion, if this happens, then the question is ischemia to be ruled out first. And then if that is ruled out, then what you do? It is a within, with the MI and then the, this arrhythmias, VT, VF, we don't need to do any ICD, but if it is late after 24, 48 hours, then the question will come. Perfectly. So can I have a question? But, so happy? but always, always we look at the ischemia substrate to exclude first. It may be a trigger from the uh, scar or the injury or the necrotic tissue, but ischemia to rule out first. Yeah, Atharvai. Yeah. Okay, yeah, sir. Actually, the uh, ECG that is considered as the idioventricular rhythm, my question is that, that is the, the rate is uh, less than 100, QRS is not so wide, one is to one conduction, retrograde yeah. P after the QRS. Can we draw a differential diagnosis from the examination purpose? Can it be, uh, that is the junctional rhythm, can be a differential diagnostic point? Or only the idioventricular rhythm is the reperfusion arrhythmia or what are the other arrhythmias that can be the reperfusion arrhythmia? Two questions. Okay. So the, if the QRS is wide, question is where is the QRS coming from? If the QRS is coming from junction, then still it is using the orthodox way of the conduction. QRS will be narrow, so it is accelerated junctional rhythm. If it is coming from the ventricle, then it will be wide, so it will be accelerated idioventricular rhythm. The one and only rhythm, reperfusion arrhythmia reliably is acute idioventricular rhythm, accelerated idioventricular rhythm. The other arrhythmias that can be present because this is a uh, patient with uh, particularly inferior. I had one patient like about a week ago where the patient went into cardiac standish still. Only P wave, no QRS. And I don't know why, and I've looked into this. When you tell the patient, if the patient is conscious, cough, 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 this uh, rhythm comes back. What the mechanism, I would be happy to hear. But, uh, and in the meantime, we give atropine and then get ready for the temporary, but the patient came back and nothing happened. So nowadays I actually do the radial and for the right coronary, as I said before, I preemptively give atropine 0.5 milligram if I'm in doubt that the patient is, after the balloon inflation or injection, patient is going into Brady because it is a mess to go into the groin and put a temporary wire because patient is already anticoagulated, access issue, then venous access actually tougher for us rather than arterial, and it, we get sometimes problem. So uh, that's what I can say about this arrhythmias. Uh, can I make a cap. comment? Yeah. I think yeah, Hafiz and um, Wadud made very, I, I'll just summarize that this post, -inter if the intervention is done properly and there is some arrhythmia, I don't think that we should become trigger happy. I mean, there is a tendency, let's start some IV amiodarone immediately. That is not all, it's, I'm not saying that we should not use it, but we should carefully evaluate this patient, that 
one episode of five seconds of non-sustainability or maybe 10 seconds. That, that, and, and the intervention was going on and after intervention, you have a good blood flow and everything. We can just follow this patient uh, uh, and then decide about antiarrhythmic or anything if there is recurrence, but not automatic. So please remember that. And we should reduce overuse of medication, especially antiarrhythmic medication. Totally agree. Uh, can I, can so this, yeah. uh, what what? using a little bit of lignocaine? If I'm a little bit afraid, because it's very short acting and the action do not uh, produce that much of harm to anything. Uh, the question is, uh, why, how about using lidocaine? I mean, and that is again the question that we have fixed the culprit. Um, and then why? Why should I use something? It has one episode, it's gone. How, you have already finished the intervention. Patient is hemodynamically stable. There is no other arrhythmia. We should, I think we can just follow this patient uh, yeah. without. Yeah. If, of course, if, if, if you find that, no, the, in, there is doubt about the intervention, the uh, uh, recanalization was not good, and you have some question about then uh, then you can do that. But otherwise, I think we can wait and observe. And uh, we have gone through this Lido and Amio and all that, and basically we just sit tight. Uh, we don't. I don't know. I uh, we don't have Lido in the cath lab, uh, other than the injection for the uh, numbing. Uh, and then we, uh, we'll have to bring uh, uh, break our uh, SCLS cart to get the Lido. Uh, and I definitely don't use Lido in the cath lab, unless in addition to the complex VT. We have this MEO and then add as an adjunct in addition to that. So the, I'll, this EKGs, for the sake of uh, clinical presentation, I will make it like 50-year-old male presenting with chest pain. But the details after you read the EKG and you have a work differential diagnosis and you can go through the history more. But so because in the emergency room, we have this problem with STEMI and STEMI mimics. So this one, is it, because some of EKGs are florid presentation, convincingly STEMI. Some EKGs are not sure. So then we do what we do, the equation. Clinical presentation is overwhelmingly STEMI. I pay less attention to the EKG. The clinical presentation is iffy, but the EKG is convincingly STEMI, I pay more attention to that. If both are iffy, then our, my formula is iffy plus iffy is more iffy. So slow down, get more info before you jump. So this one, you will agree that this is convincingly anterior ST segment elevation MI. There are actually some Q wave in the V2, V3, and then there is ST elevation in lead one AVL and there is ST segment depression in two, three and AVF. So compared to that, what about this one? Uh, Hafiz, can you go back, please? Yeah. I, I have one, I, I'm being devil's advocate. Is it possible that this patient had an old anterior myocardial infarction and the acute event is the ST elevation in one and AVL? Is that a consideration for you from your side? Possible. And I tell you, the only possibility for that, say that we see this post cabbage coming with toe pain and LV aneurysm, we can explain the ST elevation persistent in the precordial leads. But AVL and lead one and then two, three AVF depression is unlikely in those situations. So there is enough injury pattern in this. And along with the Q wave, it will be uh, coded as recent anterior ST segment elevation. And, and I would even add lateral as well. Sir, uh, one thing is that whenever you have a reciprocal change in the opposite lead, that is strongly suggests this is the primary event, this is an acute event. Here, lead 2, 3 AVF depression is actually very helpful pointing that this is actually LAD involvement and this is the acute case. However, the reciprocal change is not a must, but yeah. it, is, it is helpful, hugely if, helpful. If it and is then, helpful. Yeah, go ahead. 
and then you bring this uh, the uh, clinical picture. So uh, this one compared to the previous one, any any change of heart. From the audience, if you want to uh, put an answer. So I request you that you don't jump on saying it's STEMI. Just say that this is ST elevation MI, sinus rhythm, and then interpret the ST elevation. Is it consistent with ST elevation MI or something else? Patient coming with chest pain. One thing that you do not have in the exam, you don't have the patient with you. In the, in the clinical, in the emergency room, you have the patient with you. And feel free, if you cannot convincingly say that this is STEMI or STEMI mimic, you can ask uh, me further questions if you uh, want to. Good that answers are coming. Dr. Sabbir. Three people answered, all of them uh, saying this is pentaritis. Yes. Excellent. So those who um, are still struggling, there is precordial ST segment elevation. Look at the concave upwards. Concave upwards is not a must, but it is helpful. Uh, and then you see that lead two, three AVF, and then lead one also. So globally, I tell the fellows that God is not that unkind to give you a STEMI in all three arterial bed. Uh, rarely that can happen. Uh, and then there is ST segment um, elevation, uh, sorry, uh, PR elevation in lead AVR, PR depression in lead 2, 3 AVF. When you consider, see this, you consider TP as your baseline segment, TP. And then you consider the PR depression. And, and this is consistent with um, pericarditis. So uh, what about this one? If I tell you this, this patient has 50 year old uh, history of alcoholism and history of uh, non ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy. Yes. Coming with chest pain now. Any participant? On one side. Someone said LBPP. One person said, uh, I took MI, I think. So this non is if the patient, few things I tell the, for the exam purposes, this is left bundle. If it is in the presence of left bundle difficult, we have to invoke the Garbosa criteria, but even more importantly, clinical features. If you know the patient came into your hospital before, patient has, who knows, may have an ICD, patient may have ischemic cardiomyopathy, had a, a, a scar mark in the chest for cabbage, and you ask the patient, and the story is that chest pain going on for the last few days. You don't need to know anything. This is left bundle. There's nothing going on. You don't need to invoke STEMI in this patient. What about this one? Hafiz, can you go back to the previous ECG again? Yeah. yeah. Look at the ECG as a whole. This patient had a history of alcoholism as a diagnosis of cardiomyopathy, so dilated heart, so chambers are dilated. Look at LA in V1. LA is enlarged. P wave, uh, big component is enlarged. And this is LBVP pattern. So in this patient, that LBVP is related to the cardiomyopathy. And the LBVP right. is many And left bundle in cardiomyopathy itself is a bad prognostic marker. Bad prognostic. Um, so what about this one? Any, anyone to take this one? ST mimics or ST elevation real. I would ask for the history. <laughs> so this is the trick. 
Always, always. I gave you the default that this is a 50-year-old male with chest pain by default. Then elaborate more. This patient has you know, fever for last three days, temperature 103, and then having chest pain. And then uh, when he coughs, he has chest pain. So that again raises the question, can it be pericarditis? So if you are in doubt, then you can always take details. So what I'm trying to tell you more and more, that look at the EKG, don't feel intimidated. Look at the EKG that if it is a steel elevation, this is morphologic change, okay? But then look at the history physical and then see whether something else can be present. And when there, it is unusual, somebody running fever for last three days and coming with anterior ST segment elevation. It's unusual, common things common. And there is nothing here that, that goes in favor of injury pattern of ST, STEMI uh, that can go with the anterior ST elevation in mind. Rather, if you keep this in your mind, you know the history, you, you will look for anything else. You will look for pericarditis, just to get used to this. This patient has uh, chronic renal failure, missed dialysis, came in with history of chest pain. So and the third. So yeah. sorry, I think can you please again uh, clear the term that is mimics actually. Mimics means that it, 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 it uh, looks like a ST elevation, but it is not MI. But it, it, in the emergency room, it mimics like a STEMI, but it is not underlying pathophysiology is not STEMI. So you'll be, you'll, so like this one, you have ST elevation in this EKG, but there is peak tall T wave, patient has 50 year old chest pain, but patient is on dialysis, missed dialysis, has lethargy and coming with this. So the emergency room physician is panicked, they'll call you for a STEMI, and you look little carefully, look at the EKG, there is nothing that looks, you need to recognize this, that there are features of hyperkalemia. And if you fail to recognize and rush to the cat lab, you may have a disaster. By the time you prep the patient, do the coronary angiogram, potassium will come back, but by this time you may be coding the patient. So this is very important. This patient came in with chest pain, but was not triaged in time. And when, after two hours, the EKG done, by that time, troponin came back six, and this EKG. I'm going slow because there is no rhythm problem yet. Remember that you may have a morphologic problem and you may have a rhythm problem. So far, there is no rhythm problem, but it is just the EKG. Two, three uh, AVF, there is ST elevation, and then there is ST segment depression in V2 for sure, and then V3, not sure, V4, V5, and then top T, uh, T wave upright in V2, and then down sloping ST de slanting depression in lead one AVL. So this is a posterior MI and uh, culprit can be uh, cir circumflex. So it was not recognized early enough. This patient, uh, 50 year old and an executive in local uh, business, uh, known to have multiple cardiac risk factor. Uh, in the board meeting, did, did not feel comfortable getting some chest pain. Uh, and then chest pain got resolved, but they rushed him to the emergency room. And this EKG. His acuity duration is a little bit Smallish, isn't it? Well, I, actually, it was a good one, uh, you said, but it was actually okay. So I, uh, since Wadud mentioned this, 
uh, one of the fellow fellows were doing a question. Patient came in with rhabdomyolysis, and uh, the uh, patient has the dehydration, and then uh, renal failure, and then uh, they give an EKG. So I told them they look for either QT prolonged or QT shortened. <laughs> QT shortened, um, then can be hypercalcemia. <laughs> but it's interesting to look for. But obviously this patient has LVH, right? So you have a lot of criteria that, you know, Cornell criteria, the Romil, Estes criteria, Voltes criteria, all that. Uh, there is another criteria. Now that we do the EKG like this, I call it Asan criteria. This is this is merging this fusion. See that the fusion when that happens, usually the voltage criteria, whatever way you calculate, it will be LVH. LVH related ST segment elevation is very common, and I will show you EKG later. LVH related biphasic T wave, sometimes we call it Wallens. LVH related biphasic T wave, its sensitivity and specificity, both are low. But this patient, I gave you a clinical picture. Clinical picture was not MI, right? A little bit of second chest pain, not feeling well, board meeting. And then the, the clinical picture is not feeding well. And the EKG is LVH, not feeding well. This is a classic example of EFI plus EFI is more EFI. That means doubtful plus doubtful more doubtful. So you can just say, now, is there any way we can conclusively tell that this is not STEMI? And in the ER, they will be dancing on your nerves. No, because it, no Dr. Choudhury. Yeah. Actually, the V4, V5, actually, my first diagnosis was STMI. Yeah. It, I, I consider the LVH second. Right, but the LVH is there. So when there is LVH, be aware that there is, there, there is a confounding issue of this ST elevation may not be ST elevation of MI. It is ST elevation that is related to the LVH. But the slope, and, of, the, uh, slope of the ST, that is, that is uh, and the, the down slope, and it, it is actually consistent with the MI. Right, so it is good otherwise that you are thinking a differential. It could be LVH related, right. it could be MI related. And then and as a clinician, we always think about the worst. Can it be still MI? So you need to think about those. You need to ask history. The patient is not like behaving like an MI. Now, what do, you, what do I mean by that? MI means that the pain is prolonged, diaphoretic, 10 out of 10 chest pain. If the pain happened and lasted for 30 seconds and now not pain and the EKG, you are actually good. Take a deep breath. And then if you want to do further, do an echo imaging and the LV is hyperdynamic and normal wall motion. Remember, sub, sub endocardial ischemia or non ST elevation MI, LV wall motion can still be normal. It is very unusual for ST elevation MI with the transmural injury pattern that the LV wall motion will be normal. In one condition, LV wall motion can be normal if the fellows are in this class that the patient has mechanical complication, such as pap muscle rupture or VHD, then the, the LV recruits every bit of muscle and it becomes like hyperdynamic, even in the presence of transmyocardial injury pattern. But that is rare. Uh, can I make yeah. comment on this? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, as I understand, this patient had a brief pain, comes to the ER with this ECG. Yeah. As Athar mentioned, uh, correct, stop me if I'm wrong. There is a elevation in V1, V2, V3, V4, and it looks like, almost like hyperacute T. But the main feature is that at this point, patient is not having chest pain. Right. Correct. So that's one. So, is it wrong for me to see well, let me get a troponin yes, uh, and yeah. then follow up troponin after a few hours and get an echo yep. uh, at Absolutely. this point. Absolutely. And if Absolutely. all those come back normal, then I can uh, more or less say this is due to LVH, right? 
Yep. Now, the question would be if this patient at this point was having ongoing chest pain and diaphoresis. Yes. What will you do then? Yep. So the clinical part is so pressing that we'll have to work on that. And I will tell you that if the clinical patient, for example, having 10 out of 10 chest pain, blood pressure uncontrolled, and then, or even worse, blood pressure dropped to like 70, then there is something going on that is, that doesn't explain by this. And then I would prepare for emergency cardiac catheterization. But in the meantime, I will definitely do a bedside echo to see. Uh, but this is the steps. So okay, you the point question is quite rightly, Rafik Bhai. What I'm trying to tell everyone that STEMI, it has two parts, ST elevation part and the MI part. The ST elevation part is the EKG, but the MI part is the clinical. So we need to combine both to call it STEMI. Otherwise, we'll have to entertain other causes of ST elevation. Okay. Now, I have a question for uh, all our faculty here. Yeah. If I'm a young doctor and without any clinical history, I am given this ECG and I answer acute anterior ST elevation micro infarction, will you? Tell me I'm wrong. Let me let me be fair without, with you. without any clinical history at all. Okay. No clinical history. You just gave me an ECG and you told me you refused to give me any clinical history of this patient. And then I answer acute anterior myocardial infarction. Will you tell me off or will you say yes, it is a possibility? So so before the faculty answers, let me answer to you first. If this is an oral exam and the, the, and the student says by looking at the EKG that there is ST elevation in mind, then I will give him a second chance. I will, I will request him to explain more that what he's up to because the ST elevation part I understand, I will ask him what are the other causes of ST elevation? And do you think that the other cause of ST elevation is associated with the LVH. I expect that the student should recognize that ST elevation can be associated with LVH. And, and if, yeah. Yeah, no, that, this is great. I mean, this is a great ECG. I mean, this is a similar question that comes up with left ventricular, um, by left bundle branch block, you see ST elevation, <laughs> That's not acute MI unless they, you fulfill the criteria. So right. the clinical scenario, everything is important. And the differential diagnosis part is very, very important. Right. Thank you. Now, this is a, a EKG Abhi. that actually was given by my uh, EP friend. They also do on call and we are their backup. And the emergency room physician was like upset that this is a STEMI because they looked at the EKG by flipping the EKG, flipping. And the EP guy is saying, we don't teach EKG by flipping the EKG, because if you flip this, it will be ST elevation, right? Look at the precordial leads. If you flip the EKG, you will see ST elevation. But in reality here, it is ST depression, right? So um, w will you proceed with emergency cardiac catheterization or you will cool off the patient with the antiplatelets, anticoagulation, and cat in the morning. But the story is classic, chest pain, tight, heavy, somebody sitting on the chest, little nausea, vomiting, patient received morphine, Zofran, antiemetic, and full therapy on board. Question is, will you proceed? Hafiz Bhai, this looks like it. Hafiz Bhai? Yeah. Flipping the ECG is there in the literature and books also for diagnosing uh, the posterior MI from the surface. Absolutely, system. absolutely. So yes. I want to make sure that our participants recognize that there is ST segment depression in the V2, V1, and then you don't see it, but when there is T upright, and this is unfortunate a little bit because Isolated posterior is rare. Usually this is associated with inferior ST elevation. Yeah, yeah. But here, the inferior changes are not there. But this is so good 
as a clinical presentation and then the st depression it is it is actually a posterior acute posterior what you can do to confirm this i i forgot to bring this i had one actually where he had little bit of inferior a 92 year old day before yesterday 2 o'clock in the morning my that actually another ep guy was on call and we have a system called deactivation meaning that we deactivate the ep guy actually deactivates right a note and collects the money for the consultation and tells us to do routine cat in the morning so there is a financial incentive also right you go in the morning 2 o'clock you you see the patient you get a little bit of money but he recognized that there is the st segment in the inferior mil, very minimal so what he did he told them to do lead v789 and then we saw the posterior st elevation so that is another thing you can do why i am showing this ekg because if this is associated with rv on patient is hypotension that itself is a bad prognostic marker so hypotension in the absence of nitroglycerin and the patient has inferior posterior mi it can be really troublesome and you need to recognize that early reperfusion is good the earlier we do inferior then it is better before the rv sustains the mi and starts dilating and failing this patient actually interesting because rafiq bhai asked me this question actually this is a true story patient is a uh, little older than 50 um, is like 67 something and then came to las vegas to, for for family vacation the daughter got concerned because dad did not feel well and then brought to the emergency room by the time he came to the emergency room he says i'm absolutely fine no issues he wants to go home and does not want to ruin the family vacation but the ekg was like this and the emergency room doctor called for a stemi i did not do much but i canceled the stemi what what was the clue anything you want to know because there is st elevation clearly there is q wave right so if the emergency room physician says this is sinus rhythm st elevation you know i figured out the patient has cabbage in the past yes and he comes from pittsburgh and pittsburgh his his doctor is actually my my buddy from residency i called him he was luckily in the clinic i said does he have an lv aneurysm he even did not look at the record he said i know him he has an lv aneurysm yes so nothing done the patient okay. went home uh, and then done That so now yeah bhai they get the moral is we have to take pay attention to the history yes All, always this decide about the interpretation of the ecg yeah by mm -hmm. the light of uh, associated history so this is my theme today that mm -hmm. ekg basics and beyond this is Abhishek, the beyond can add, part can i add something if yeah. someone finds uh, such deep qm uh, they should think alternative diagnosis rather than yes. stemi Yes. Only, only stemi. Yes. They should think about other diagnoses also. And, and that's old, actually a good point. Old age is also present like this, which uh, when they uh, have the uh, septal or anterior uh, aneurysm. Yeah. And then the the question is that if there is an we don't call Q wave MI or non Q wave MI now nowadays. Why? Because the Q wave does not mean that it is dead dead. that is still maybe peri infarct area so the yeah. clinical is more important if there is active chest pain dead muscle does not cry if there is active chest pain and the q appearance you can still go and salvage in yeah. the lytics world up to 12 hours with the late trial we knew beyond 6 hours up to 12 hours lytics is still may be helpful beyond 12 hours lytics may not be helpful then you go into this broad heading of post infarct angina you may salvage some post infarct area and from the peri infarct ischemia if you open this if it is a late presentation q wave and patient is asymptomatic this is probably done deal 
and then you can follow the OAT trial, uh, open artery hypothesis that late presentation, no clinical signs of ischemia, then you, you don't open that artery, you can sit tight. Can I, make Arura, I, I, I want to uh, open up one uh, patient, two, two of my patients who had acute chest pain, ongoing chest pain and having this kind of uh, QM. But after opening the uh, artery on the later follow-up after three or six months, the, uh, the QRS complex became almost normal and ECO does not say any reason of all motion abnormality. So the can I, Q can wave I make a comment, Hafiz? Yeah. Sir, sir. I, I'm going to make a, it's not a medical comment I'm making. If you paid attention to the Hafiz's discussion, when he saw this, he asked the patient, who is your doctor? Not only that, sir, he made sir. a phone call, which is 3000 miles from his location. And that is what medicine is all about. That he just didn't say, oh, this is an old MI but he tried to find the information, actually called his friend. And his friend actually remembered this patient, so we do that. So that means when we are in the business of medicine, not only we take care of the acute problem, we remember the patients, we make effort to find the information. I think that is very, very, and with today's technology, we can actually find the information. And we do it all the time. Very, very good point, Ravik Bhai. And we, in Bangladesh, for example, we have a very good telephone system. We know everybody, each other. So this networking sometimes also be helpful. And also another important thing, um, I do that here, you know, this, and now I think you are doing it in Bangladesh. Particularly, uh, I'm worried about this arrhythmia business. Yeah. One EP guy does not agree with another EP guy. So I take group text them and, and then get a consensus. But um, difficult cases, EKGs, imaging, you can share and do a networking. It also helps the friendship as well. So, uh, but this, I wanted to ask you about this one. This was actually a tough one. Patient comes in with chest pain and luckily patient can talk. Sometimes we see these kind of patients coming intubated and we cannot get anything else. And the ER is saying, this is STEMI because there is ST elevation in the uh, D1, B2, B3, B4, what do we do with this? Um, and this is clearly AV paste. Can we interpret anything out of it? Anybody answering? No. Mm, I mean, it's a pacemaker ECG. Uh, it's tough to interpret this. Tough to interpret. Uh, yes. In left bundle, we have a standard criteria. But with, with pacemaker, you don't know where the lead is. And even in paced ECG, if, if you change the rate, sometimes you'll see the ST segment changes. So it, you cannot interpret this ECG. So if, if, if patient can talk, a few things we can do, we can ask, you know, what is the history, what pain, all the details about the pain, and then ask when was the pacemaker done, and then look at the pacemaker, is it a pacemaker or this is a ICD, whether there is any scar mark in the chest, whether this is a cabbage. Cabbage patient presenting with STEMI is very rare, uh, but most often they present with acute coronary syndrome, non st elevation in mind. But they can present, but it is rare, and then gather more info. Uh, and this is the whole point, that don't feel intimidated by the EKG. This is AV paste. And uh, some people will say, you can apply Garbosa criteria, which I'm going to show you later, but it may not. It may not work in the paste world, but e ER literature says that you can invoke Garbosa, but I'm not quite sure. But go by the clinical, get an imaging, and then decide. How about this one? Left bundle with I ST. Yeah. Can you go back to the previous CCG? Yeah. Oh, for some of our audience, they may not be aware of what we are talking about. Look at the ECG. In the lead one, pay attention to it. Just before the QS complex, there is a sharp spike. And look at lead two. You get the same spike twice, before the P wave, before the QS complex. So that means there is electronic signature 
before each complexes, both atrium and ventricular. That's why he's saying AV pacing, atrioventricular pacing. And whenever you have pacing ECG, you cannot rely on ECG. Rather, you should go for the history, and you should look at the e e e echo, and look at the tropide result, and yes. de decide about your treatment approach. So unlike the previous lab bundle, this one has ST elevation V5, V6. And of course, there is a ST elevation in the precordial V1, V2, V3, V4, lead one AVL, right? Yeah. So, the, and the patient has 10 out of 10 chest pain. So this patient has an ongoing ST elevation in mind. So this is obvious. So I just wanted to bring that example so that you know. Uh, and then uh, this is lip bundle, unlike the previous one, lip bundle, but it does not have any criteria that can fulfill the garbosa so-called, you know? There is no ST elevation in any other lead, uh, but the precordial leads, maybe four, three, but here it is really more than five and other leads ST segment elevation. So it, it does, and the clinical picture. Always, always clinical. Um, and now I'm going to show you a series of right bundle. The, this right bundle, unlike left bundle, difficult to read, right bundle, we should not have any problem to read the ST elevation. And this is right bundle, complete right bundle. You can ask yourself whether is it possible to uh, interpret right ventricular hypertrophy in the presence of right bundle. If there is a right axis deviation and the R amplitude is more than 10, 7, 10, then you may, but it was purely right bundle. This is another example of Everyone should be able to recognize this EKG now. I mean, eight and nine, this actor. Have you said? I mean, this is what I mean. I mean, 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 I if the EKG looks like pulse ox symmetry wave, then there is a big trouble. <laughs> so, and, and everybody should be in your brainstem reflex that once you see the EKG, you don't ask for potassium level. You start treating, please. Start treating. Uh -huh. Hafiz, yeah. can I make a comment? Yeah. The two ugly ECGs that we see in clinical practice, one is this, other is WPW syndrome with atrial fibrillation rapid ventricular yes. response. Yes. Two ugly, ugly looking ECG, you think of these two diagnoses. If this right. is regular, right. then it is this. If it is irregular, probably consider uh, WPW with excessive passive conduction with A3. But look at the T wave. If the T wave is humongous, then it goes. Now, you will see this kind of problem with right bundle. But that, you need to familiarize yourself uh, if you are not familiarized, always ask help. Always look at the clinical picture. But this is the what I call the shoulder down, shoulder down ST elevation in lead one, V1, V2, V3. This is typical of Brugada. And again, look at this right-sided corner. If the, you are seeing this patient in the office, patient is seeing you in the office for chest pain for last three months or palpitation for last three months or symptoms, nothing acute going on, please don't send the patient by ambulance to the emergency room. We have a, we, we had that problem. The patient was sent because the doctor got worried with the CKG. Patient was fine. Doctor was worried. Uh, and then recognize this several types. This, this talk is not for that, but several types of Brugada and those who are in cardiology, they need to know what is the channelopathy and all that. And then another important thing. And again, there is right bundle pattern, sorry about the V1, but there is ST elevation with the right bundle. But this patient was profoundly hypoxic, had a intracranial mass surgery about three weeks ago and was uh, in the emergency room with shortness of breath 
and then had this EKG, STEMI was activated, and then patient coded. And we, I was on the way to the hospital. What should I do? Did cath lab saying, do you want us to take this patient to the cath lab? I asked one question to the, uh, to the nurse actually, that what was the rhythm when the patient coded? Patient coded with pulseless electrical activity. Remember, if it is a transmural MI giving injury pattern, and we should be able to read in the presence of right bundle, can be anterior MI, but the code will be expected to be beefy. MI patients going into PA arrest is rare. It can happen if there is a post MI ventricular rupture and tamponade, it can happen. If the patient goes into mechanical complications and heart failure, hypoxia, PEA, it can happen. But common things come on. He came in with hypoxia and then went into PEA arrest. So before I arrived, I told them to get a CTA done. CTA showed pulmonary embolism. And to my surprise, this, this was the father of one of the cath lab nurses from another hospital. Thanks God that I did not take to the cath lab. It would have been embarrassing. So, and then there is chronic thromboembolism. With the chronic pulmonary thromboembolism, you can get this pattern with RV strain as well. Yes. So right bundle and RV strain. That can give you uh, this EKG pattern. The ER, emergency room physician may be worried with the ST depression, ugly, and they will call you. They don't see any ST elevation, but it's ugly looking, but you need to figure this out. Another important thing, this Wallens syndrome biphasic, I'm showing you, historically Wallens uh, showed this biphasic two types, biphasic or deep. I would not worry too much about deep because the deeper the EKG, ST inversion deeper, the uglier, uglier this type B, it is less likely coronary. We all know that in this forum we have discussed this, but this EKG pattern biphasic, I tell the fellows, I don't care what you call this, STEMI or you call it not non STEMI, but this patient has prox LAD. One important thing, this patient comes to you or to the hospital, do not do any stress testing on these patients. And you will see them troponin positive. This is, you have to recognize that this is ugly uh, with the biphasic T wave. Um, and then this patient, uh, I showed it before, uh, those who did not attend last lecture, this is very deep T waves. Patient is in neurosurgical unit, in intracranial event, the patient has what do we call this subarachnoid hemorrhage, subdural hematoma, stroke, all this intracranial with long QT can give you this. Why this happens, uh, we are now learning that this can be associated with some stra st strain on the, on the heart, can be associated with Takasubu. Could be adrenaline surge and could be inflammatory surge or could be uh, some serotonin surge. Three pathways so far been identified, but you can see this EKG. Best way, always look at the clinical. If the, you, you, and your life may be easy on, the, on your part not to do cath. If the platelet is 30, patient has intracranial bleed, you tell the referring physician, we cannot do, get an echo and do a contrast echo. You might see something in this. Another important thing, very, very important. If you see this, this is described by D winter. This is called the D winter sign. It is like in the V1, V2, V3, you see ST depression, then a sharp angle and hyperacute T. You can have a differential, but again, clinical history. If the patient is having chest pain, diaphoretic, short of breath, patient is sweaty, and then looking very sick, and this EKG, you need to worry about whether this is a D winter sign could be suggestive of a proximal LAD. Look at this pattern. I'm giving you several examples of this, that hyperacute T, and then 
patient coming with this. This is original paper of D. Winter in New England Journal 2008. There are different way he described this T wave in this, but you need to recognize that the patient can present. But the bottom line, the message is clear. This is not, to me, I tell the fellows, this EKG doesn't look normal. And patient coming with convincing chest pain, you need to remember from D. Winter's publication that this could be acute proximal LAD disease. And, and look at this. We should not have any trouble if we know they, there is such thing ex exist. This is it, that the patient with acute chest pain and this EKG, it is called this D. Winter sign. So to summarize this, we, need, we learned today that there are many causes of ST elevation. One thing I did not mention is this, uh, called the early repo. You, will, you can pull the paper from New England Journal of Medicine. Early, repo, early repolarization abnormality can mimic, but there are other causes like left ventricular hypertrophy, left bundle branch block, acute pericarditis. You can have this pseudo-infraction pattern from this hyperkalemia, tall peak T wave. You can have the typical ST elevation with anterior wall MI, and you can have ST elevations and MI in the presence of right bundle, and then ST mimic, but not ST elevation MI from the Brugada syndrome. So these are the differential. You know the criteria for the STEMI, but always, 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 always think that there is a clinical part there. ST elevation is one part. ST elevation along with the clinical picture makes it STEMI. Now, a couple of cases and then I'll finish. This EKG is concerning. Uh, I showed this before, but this is right bundle, but there is ST elevation in V2, V3, and then V5, V6 anterior, and there is alternating PVCs. And then you can see there is some changes in the, in the, in the, in the inferior lead, but not as florid as in the precordial leads. So this patient had, as expected, anterior wall MI, and then also had right coronary occlusion. But importantly, we need to know the coronary and uh, the conduction system and supply. You can look at the textbook and figure out when you are dealing with this right coronary, what part of the right coronary you're dealing with and anticipate before you get into trouble. Once we notice that problem in the EKG and then both sided, we definitely put a temporary wire and then take care of the coronaries and then um, everything went very well and patient had a good outcome. So it's just this basic preparation before we embark on this because once we start doing the PCI, it is going to get worse first and you may not be able to resuscitate the patient if you're not prepared. So having said that, how about this one? This is right bundle pattern, but very florid inferior ST elevation. And there is some changes in the precordial leads. Repolarization changes in the precordial leads with right bundle without ST depression does not count a lot, but look at the ST elevation, huge. So this is no question that we can read ST elevation with right bundle. We should also be able to read anterior MI with right bundle. And here it is, right bundle anterior. But sometimes my life can be difficult. What about this one? This patient has right bundle and actually did not have any troponin rise. Tachycardia, any, any comment? Rovik by tachycardia, right bundle was in the floor and uh, we controlled the heart rate. It became less ugly, troponin came negative. It was, looks like that some atrial tachy, we actually called it a fib initially we, because it's probably reg, irregular here. Yes, so sir. I give you a series, right bundle looks ugly, but there is no ST elevation. So don't feel intimidated 
with the right bundle. Sometimes it looks ugly, but there is nothing. And this ST changes in the AVR, which is part of the right bundle. And when you call the ST elevation, then you need to see the ST segment to call it ST elevation. So the right bundle can be problematic, but as I showed you earlier, in the presence of right bundle, you also need to know the right bundle branch block with precordial ST elevation, or for that matter, inferior. The differential should also take into consideration the clinical context, because clinical context is very important and because the other differential can be rare, very rare to give pulmonary embolism with the right bundle and ST elevation, rare. So um, oh, how about this one? Should we call this an ST segment elevation MI or should we call this, by the way, this is looks like pretty regular RR interval, atrial flutter, and then precordial ST segment elevation and what we should do, we actually control the rate and it still looks like elevated, no reciprocal changes. And the dialysis patient hyperkalemia turns out to be pericarditis with this. But this one with the right bundle, ST elevation, I'm now taking to you in a different way Look at how the ST elevation with right bundle evolving. Right bundle the, and the complete right bundle, ST evolving. And this is from my previous collection, the right bundle, how it is evolving. This is interesting. This is a patient that we had just a couple of weeks ago, 59 year old, and then noted ST segment elevation in the, in the OR. Uh, I cannot read this. This is the uh, ischemic bowel. And then this happened. They stopped and then they called us. So this is what we call the shark fin. Look at the ST elevation in the precordial leads. So, the, and if you Google it or PubMed it, it is reported, this is called shark fin. It looks like shark fin, right? And, and, and that is a bad prognosis. This patient had a CT of the abdomen and one of our fellow found out that in the chest, when they did it, there is calcium in the LAD, but the left main looks okay. Patient was hypotensive, resuscitation done, and the EKG normalized, but we excluded and we did the cath and this is the LAD. Uh, ST segment normalized, full reperfusion, and then RCA was okay. And then interestingly, what happened? Look at this LV gram. It is little mid ventricular dyskinesia, but the apex moved. We actually told them that ST segment normalized, complete ischemic bowel surgery. Patients should be able to tolerate that. He did, and then. Uh, Subsequently, plan was to do the LID. Now, this is a patient, unfortunately, I'll show you this, that how the shark fin EKG is a problem. Came into the emergency room following Bifibar as post Bifib, the patient had this ST elevation in the inferior. And Rafiq Bhai, you may have a comment. We see this all the time. The, the bigger the ST elevation, the chances of arrhythmia and, and, and poor prognosis. And, and I call it now that, actually I did not call it, one of our tech pointed out that look at the shark fin. We talked about shark fin, but there is called the pectoral fin in the, in the, in the pectoral area. And this is, looks like pectoral fin. The V3, V2 looks like pectoral fin. Nobody has described that. Shark fin is de described, but not the pectoral fin. If you have any EKG like this, give it to me. I'm collecting this because these are bad prognosis. Uh, we could not save that patient. He hired further VF and then died, but clearly echo showed inferior ST segment, uh, uh, severe hypokinesis. This is another EKG with 
it till flutter and then this happen it till flutter and then a patient had uh, this ekg with shortness of breath and i would ask you something funny going on look at this side of the ekg looks like shark fin so it's bad st elevation in the precordial lid right uh, but in the left side what is the rhythm this uh, this beat root 23 abf we had controver i don't know any comment rafik bhai is it a fib aberrancy or non sustained vt uh, that's difficult to see because you see <coughs> noise like, the st segment is changing so dramatically yeah. that is difficult to differentiate whether it's this a ventricular complexes or like here one of the beat the previous bit so looks look like at this. after thing. after we control the rate little bit and then give the hemodynamic support with the liver fed look at the ekg normalized but of course we did the we did the cath and it showed uh, multi vessel disease this is the and um, because patient with hypotension became more ischemic and became uh, caused this trouble so left bundle we talked about this it is a problematic it's a garbosa but i just wanted to point out that if you have the garbosa criteria 1 versus 2 versus all 3 then the specificity actually goes higher uh but for practical purposes i would request you to look at the right side look at the right side clinical presentation is important and with the left bundle elderly patient please auscult it because many of them has cardiomyopathy previous cabbage aortic stenosis they may have a pacemaker they may have an icd they may have this scar mark pointing cabbage but left bundle and presenting with shock is a bad news so please pay attention to this but if the patient can talk you can take history then please go by the clinical presentation convince yourself that the florid presentation of mi then you can pay more attention whether this is true or not this patient with afib atrial fibrillation and then went to the emergency room with chest pain shortness of breath and then rate was uncontrolled but i would request you to look at the st segment in the st segment in the uh, precordial lid horizontal or sometimes like down slope in st segment depression very ischemic looking ekg and lead avr st elevation clinical context is good we control the rate we took to the cath lab and this is what we found you can see that there is a proximal lad right coronary mid and then circumflex uh, situation and then this 41 year old got this lexi scan the the chemical part they are giving the isotope you went into a fib and then with the afib got this st segment depression so i said you don't need any further completion of the scan this is good enough and then look at this what 41 year old uh, but look at this what we got that uh, this is osteal lad uh, and then uh, we did the uh, intervention came out good and we did not need any further so the ekg in the presence of arrhythmias you can see the st segment depression and rovik bhai asked me to make sure that we address this that following this interaction about anti coagulation anti platelets this is the hierarchy the, uh, recognize that the more we use the triple therapy the bleeding risk the hazard ratio goes high and there are lots of studies showing that this hierarchy of using this uh, different uh, regimen and then your uh, hazard ratio is 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 unfavorable with more bleeding but we use this triple therapy or dual therapy to avoid ischemic event and these are the mechanism why bleeding is bad bleeding following pci is bad because with bleeding you discontinue you can give blood transfusion patient may go to hypotension anemia shock inflammation 
a cascade of things can happen that lead to further ischemic event and increased mortality. Therefore, attempts have been made. Can we do something different? Can we reduce the duration of the triple therapy? Can we live with dual antiplatelet therapy? And these are the different trials. And these are the theme that if you get this patient who needs anticoagulation, then give triple therapy in the first four weeks or three months when there is the issue of endothelialization. But after that, give the dual, dual therapy with one anticoagulation and one antiplatelet and reduce the risk of bleeding and still uh, avoid the ischemic event. So that is that. And then re so recognize that there are a lot of comorbidities uh, the patient can come in with. But one of the worst challenges of EKG interpretation is when the patient comes in with cardiac arrest. This is a patient post cardiac arrest, ST segment elevation in the precordial, like a AVR, ST depression. You know that this patient with global ST changes and AVR ST elevation have left main multivessel, ugly. So before we jump, we need to figure out what you are going to do. If the patient is profound shock, pH is bad. 6.9 is my cutoff. Not, I would not talk to anyone if the patient pH is 6.9, less than. 6.9 to 7.2, you can still negotiate. But more than 7.2 prognosis is usually good if you can deliver the, deliver the care in the presence of shock. And the patient has a STEMI. Rafik Bhai asked me to, to give a slide. When there is the issue like this, do you take the patient to the cath lab immediately or you can afford to wait? Because his point is, if the patient is non-STEMI, can we afford to wait? In the STEMI world, we say no, and we give you know, neuro protection if we need to, we assess the neuro outcome, and that determines the overall outcome. You can give hypothermia therapeutic, and at the same time, give hemodynamic support itself is a separate talk. But think, think about the theme. You need to negotiate with everybody, including the family members, and then ask them to understand that these are the prognostic markers. Prolonged resuscitation time, profound shock with multiple pressors, pH less than 7.2, less than seven, and then a patient has significant comorbidities, multi-organ failure, outcome will be bad. And therefore, we need to understand when we call it futility of care. And, and, and the cost is also important. Therefore, we need to pay attention. However, if the patient returns to circulation immediately after cardiac arrest, and then you look at the EKG, and EKG is not a STEMI, then you need to wait for the neuroprotect uh, outcome. And you can afford. This is a study from 2000. Uh, 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 19 that says you can wait a couple of days and see the neuro outcome and then do the cath. You don't need to go immediately. So we had our patient, 53 year old, ST elevation with atrial flutter, resuscitated from the field, and this is the EKG. Look at this: inferior ST elevation, atrial flutter, post resuscitation. We know that this is going to be a bad outcome. We did the right heart cath. LB function is very poor. And then, and then you look at this uh, uh, the angiography. You try to do as much as you can in the cath lab. Uh, you see that there is a chronic total right coronary, but the LAD is bad. And then when we give the hemodynamic support, there is impeller placement. And then we did this uh, stenting. And then uh, overall, the patient survived. So it is important that we understand the EKGs. We define ST elevation MI, non-ST elevation MI, the prognostic markers. And then uh, in the case of post-cardiac arrest, who are at high risk, return of spontaneous circulation or in the presence of shock, and then have a good idea that what we are going to do and not jump on uh, regardless of the outcome. I think that all those considerations 
are very, very important when we are deciding on intervening in this in these patients. So with that, I will stop and any questions. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you. It was a brilliant presentation. Uh, in fact, we listened to your lecture for the last 90 minutes, and I think everybody enjoyed it, this lecture. Uh, one of the questions from a doctor, Dr. M. A. Mutin. Sir, whether thrombolytics can be used in D winters with clinical features of AMI, especially <laughs> where cath facility is not available. Okay, so um, that's actually... Question. Disconnected probably. Uh, he's not in the screen, probably. Uh, we can network problem. Lofik Salasi. It is the mother field. From the lighting, it will have the mother. That's it. Sir, in case of question, question, repeat. In case of Thrombolytics can be used in D winters uh, with clinical features of AMI, especially where cat facility is not available. Clinical features of acute coronary syndrome, not AMI. But the ECG shows D winters, ECG, tall T. The point is. Uh, I haven't seen any guidance or guideline, whatever, of using thrombolytics in this situation. The idea is that this patient should have early cath. That's the point. If we do not have that, we can treat it like a non-STMI. But I'm not sure any authority would suggest or accept that we should be using thrombolytics. Asafi? I am uh, actually agree with you. This is the point I think. That is uh, either uh, uh, that is a early cat or if, or if it is not available, it should Absolutely. be as a non so yes, What happened uh, that? Sorry. I want to add something that in this case, yeah. as cat lab is not available, so if we can have a uh, crop I done within an hour. And if it is raised, then we can consider for some blues. Particularly high sensitive troponin. Yeah. 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 Excellent point. Excellent the, the, point. the point is, can we use thrombolytics in deep winters? The question is to have it. Point. You need to convince yourself. It is generally not recommended in, in the lytics world, but logistically challenging situation. I think something to think about. Actually, I have used suspected left pain case. I have used uh, over telephone. I got the ECG and suggested you use thrombolysis. Otherwise, you cannot save the patient at the dead end of night. And we used that. We did the cat there later on. We found that the patient has critical left pain disease and triple vessel disease. The patient later had uh, cabbage and survived. So, Wadu, that little flow is so important because yes. when there is no flow, getting some flow by time. Yeah, and I think what is ideal in the literature versus sometimes because of the logistics changes, understanding the pathophysiology, we need to cater ourselves differently. Yeah, can I make a comment? Yeah, I mean, for the audience, that what is this reluctance about using thrombolytics? Because the problem is that you can end up with bleeding when you don't want it. Patient. So I think a proper clinical evaluation of these patients, I mean, is very, very important that what is the associated bleeding risk. Um, so we don't have a cath lab and I suspect there is left main and if I can open up the vessel, but on the other hand, if I don't evaluate this patient properly for bleeding risk, I may end up with a bleed in the brain. I may save the heart, but the patient will be in stroke. So that's important. So I think the, the bottom line is the clinical assessment of the patient is so important. Right. And then we should give antiplatelet and anticoagulation at least. Yeah. That's what I was suggesting. They at least we should at least we should treat it like a, a, a high risk non-STMI. Yes. 
High risk. Yeah. Thank you, sir. And I'm going to I'm going to summarize this lecture today. I mean, I have to, this is you all you are always. I mean, this proves that you are a superb teacher. I mean, you can talk about simple things also, which I understand. <laughs> which is good. This, this, what Hafiz did today is please follow it that he uh, showed um, normal ECG how to diagnose acute. By the way, Rafiq nice count about me doesn't count because he likes me too much. <laughs> no, no. So what he did is what normal ECG. Um, Q, no, when I say normal, the normal QRS duration, acute MI diagnosis. And then take it to context, the clinical scenario of the patient. Also look at differential diagnosis. And one of the very, very interesting ECG I found that patient had high voltage ECG, not classic left band uh, LVH. That means there is voltage criteria for left ventricular hypertrophy and there is ST elevation, but the patient is not having chest pain. That's important. Second thing that we looked at, the bundle bank blocks. And left bundle, we always talk about left bundle, and we um, know this, but the criteria, use of criteria. The fact that left bundle, um, we can use garbosa in left bundle, uh, doesn't mean that we can use the same criteria for pacemaker patients. Uh, we have to be careful about it. Again, in this situation, we have to take the clinical context. The other part that Hafi showed was, very nicely presented the right bundle and different patterns of ECGs. That, that's important, that in the setting of right bundle, uh, it is much easier to recognize. Um, the other one was the posterior infarct, that somebody with early transition, tall R wave in V2 with significant ST depression, keep in mind uh, the posterior infarct. Uh, otherwise, somebody, anybody could have said, well, this is just ischemia, unstable angina, but actually patient was having an acute for sure. Well, am I? A wonderful presentation. Happy. Thank you. I learned a lot today. So I wanted to add one thing for everybody that, um, particularly our young colleagues, that when the patient is confused and the patient doesn't have shock or heart failure, don't rush. Buy time. Because I tell the patient that don't care the confused patient because neurological issues is a big issue. <laughs> so, and then you might be in trouble, you know, and, and then when you say about troponin and, and neurology, by the way, the post-cardiac arrest, as you saw in my slide, calling neurology post-cardiac arrest and consult and CT head is usually useless because they, uh, my wife is a neurologist, I can say this. Uh, they, they usually they say toxic metabolic encephalopathy, which means nothing to me at that time. They, they will call it toxic metabolic encephalopathy, which is ridiculous diagnosis, and it is totally not helpful. It's like uh, calling hematology oncology for thrombocytopenia in a patient who has balloon pump, got PCI stent on aspirin, plavix, and then and, and also getting sepsis and getting antibiotics. They come and they write a differential of thrombocytopenia, totally useless. And the patient is getting heparin. <laughs> so you need to learn these things yourself, that what is the likely issue on that particular setting. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, in fact, that's why the ST, STEMI activation, regarding STEMI activation, there is a, a study I have gone through that around 10 to 40% cases, there is false activation of the STEMI because the ECG reading of STEMI is really difficult one. And they have allowed that up to 10% of the false activation is allowed. Uh, but if it is more than 10% false activation, that means the ECG interpretation was not Right so, Firoz, let me tell you our hospital statistics. You have brought a big issue. So I tell them to be more sensitive. You don't need to be more specific so that we don't miss. Our ER physician initiated STEMI activation. False activation is over 30%. And the, the emergency EMS, ambulance triggered ST elevation, the false activation is actually less than 20%. So the 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 ambulance crew, they are not physicians, but their pickup rate is better than the physician because physicians are oversensitive, you know. Thank you, but, sir. But Hafiz, in all fairness, the ambulance people get called when the patients are having chest pain. Yeah, yeah, selection. I, so, I, uh, I, I get it. it. Uh, but the ER gets all kinds of selection patients. bias. Yeah, selection, selection bias. bias. Thank but, you, sir.
The other way around is we are missing a lot of patients who have clues that suggest they are having proxy LAD lesion. For example, due winters or due equivalent syndrome. So these are the cases where we should be uh, more sensitive to understand the patient is having an acute coronary syndrome. It may not be the diagnosis of ST elevated MI, but it's still it's an acute coronary syndrome which needs very early intervention or aggressive uh, uh, therapy. That's the point we should be taking care. Thank you, sir. Uh, I think Professor Atarali, sir, can wrap up the session and conclude the session. Uh, actually, Firoz, it was a outstanding lecture, outstanding. So, Rehapi's congratulations and thank you very much. And I, 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 I think we have fulfilled the expectation of our participants. Excellent and beautiful lecture. Excellent ECGs. Beautiful discussion. Really, I, I have learned a lot of things today. Many, many of the things. So, uh, I must congratulate Sodri Hafiz. We want to hear you uh, again and again from you. So, uh, finally, thank you very much. And, uh, Firoz, we yes. can conclude the session with the announcement that uh, in the next Saturday, we have got Sahana okay. uh, Zaman and Rupik sir. Okay. Sahana okay. Zaman is already asked to uh, few ECG to show his, uh, her few ECGs. And I think the Rupik sir will give a final lecture. Sure. Thank you, sir. All right. Thank you. Uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Good night. Thank you, sir. Mujunda sir, ekta jine shamaadar ke bolle. The session gula duita karone. Ekta hoche faculty develop, ekta hoche student dekhe shekharno, aur ekta hoche faculty development kora. To aske jo Hafiz sir lecture shune jara faculty ase, tadher bujha hoche je how to present a topic. Mane ekta simple topic ki bhabe ekta shundo present korte hoye. It's a faculty there, Bujaruchi, Shekhauti. I have a summon, say, very ninety minutes audience, Duraka is outstanding. Very faculty to the boy, Chuloja, the Carpore. I can listen to the Nutun faculty to the boy in Ashamne. I mean, protestation, না ওইটা ওইটা যখন হচ্ছে এখন যে কেউ ইসিজি দেখতে গেলে কিন্তু আরো অনেক কিছু দেখবে আজকের এই লেকচারের পরে আমার আমার আই এম শিওর তো এটা বলা হয় যে আই ওয়াজ কনফিউজড টুডে আই এম অলসো কনফিউজড বাট আই এম কনফিউজড এট আ हायर লেভেল মানে আমি আগে কম জানতাম এখনো মনে হবে যে কম জানি কিন্তু আমি একটা हायर লেভেলে পৌঁছাই কম ফিরোজ ফিরোজ তুমি এম এন আলম স্যার এর লেকচার তোমরা করছো কিনা মেডিসিনে मानफरमेशन मैं Salmonella type T found in the culture is confirmatory. But Sar Bullojana, there are some bacterial shedder. They have possessed the bacteria as a carrier in their vessels, and these are shed and these are coming to the culture. So a viral fever may yield a positive salmonella culture. Totally Ihoegalam, the teller keyholo. So Sar lectures with Pakar Kalimona, the more you know, more you become. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Beximko. Uh, Ribu, thank you, everybody. You are supporting thank us you, a lot. Thank you very much for your support. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.